I was a student. Uh, so I studied under Roger Martin, our dean. Uh, he was my comp sci one professor. And uh, I had a pretty successful career at IBM after I left Marist. I kind of stayed in the area on and off over the years. I spent four years in Texas with, with IBM. My wife and I raised our family in Hyde Park. And when I had enough of IBM, I decided I'd semi-retire by going back to teaching. And the dean and the faculty here were kind enough to allow me to come back as a professional lecturer. And so I've been here for this is my third year. I put this presentation together for a conference on advising that Debbie Hines and the team sponsor each year here on the Mayor's campus. And this is a short version of it. We're going to talk a little bit about, um, as faculty, what we can do to maybe improve the advising sessions that we have with students. Let me start by asking you, do, do you have a favorite family recipe? The holidays are coming up. Is there a, is there a favorite you know, turkey stuffing recipe or a, a cookie recipe for the, for the Christmas holiday, year-end holidays, or a favorite, I don't know, maybe mixed beverage recipe for the, uh, the, the New Year celebration, right? And as you think about that favorite recipe, when I pose that question to you, was it just the recipe and the experience of eating or drinking that came to mind, or was it all, all the other memories that came kind of flooding back? And as you think more about maybe that cookie, or that drink, or that stuffing, you have those memories that come with it about the experience. Yeah, so, uh, for me, it was my grandmother's pickles, and it was a recipe that was actually lost because there wasn't a recipe, or so we thought. And my grandma and her sisters used to make canned pickles every summer. And I remember, as much as eating the pickles all through winter and into the spring, I remember more the smell of the vinegar boiling and the, the talk of my grandmother and her sisters chatting in the kitchen and laughter and of course there was a lot of cigarette smoking in those days so you had that. I remember it comes back to me every time um, but it having been lost until when, after my grandmother passed we dug this out of a dumpster. <clears throat> we had literally pulled a box of stuff out and sometimes I bring this with me. It was actually a ledger book and this is actually my great grandmother's handwriting that had been passed to my grandmother. And so the, the recipe was found, and I was actually able to recreate my grandmother's pickles. Um, so what we need to do is we need to think about the memories and make things memorable for people. Because for me, it was more than just the tricking. It was all those memories, the smells, the tastes, the feelings that come in, and it's that experience that makes those pickles so much more than just making pickles. I can go to the store and buy bread and butter pickles that taste pretty much like my grandmother's. Um, they come very close, actually. But these memories that now I'm creating are the things that we want to focus on because, in my opinion, it's time now to help our students experience advising. And so as a tool for us to take away from today's presentation, I'm going to use this word cook as an acronym. So let's go ahead and cook with them. What we want to do is we want to use coaching. We want to use the powers of observation that we are all really good at anyway. We want to have open minds and use openness. And we want to keep on trying. So these are the keys to how we can transform the way we're advising students. So advising, similar to coaching. I'm going to make a, a premise here, uh, but can you recall a great coach that you might have had in your life, either a sports coach or a career coach? Or maybe do you remember a great teacher? And can you think about the qualities that that awesome teacher who inspired you had? I'm betting they were the coaching skills that they had, not the fact that they knew math really well, or they knew the entire history of the United States inside and out something else about that teacher. Who is it that inspired you? So we, as faculty, we can be great coaches as well, but why would we want to? Well, first of all, we all love teaching. I've often heard it said that uh, 
we teach for free. They pay us to create. Right? They pay us to do all the administrative stuff. Teaching is our passion. It's what we love doing. So all that time outside the classroom, that administrative work, uh, is the thing we don't like. And advising is an admin duty at times, and seen that way. But it doesn't have to be. It, it doesn't have to be viewed as a chore. We can change the mindset of our own that says, look, do we want to be one of those teachers that's remembered for forever, forever and ever? Do we want immortality? Do we see ourselves as the individual that inspired someone to the point where they remember us 20 years from now and are talking about us 20 years from now? If that's the case, then we need to do the things in advising that our students will actually remember. And that's the coaching that we give them, not just the advising. Let me give a quick peek at what the next chart is. So what are those qualities that a coach has? What are the things we can do differently in an advising session that a coach has that you can think of? This is the audience participation part of the program. Problem solving together. Yes, problem solving together. Exactly. If you just give a student an answer, you haven't taught them anything. Okay. How's that old adage go? Teach someone to fish, you fed them forever. Yeah. Right? Don't give them the fish, teach them to fish. Coaches motivate. They do, don't they? We have to be motivational. We have to be careful that we're not so aspirational that they get discouraged. But certainly, giving someone some motivating factor, giving them a motivational speech, telling them that what they've done is good and they can do better. Um, I also find that some of the best coaches are the ones that actually point out to us what we've done wrong. Constructively, and maybe turn it into something motivational. Um, when I was a manager at IBM for years, um, I kind of just followed the, the rest of the managers. Okay, when you give someone their year-end evaluation, tell them all the things they did great, and then tell them what their score is, and get them out of your office. And I would have people come back and say, oh, wait a minute, you told me I was great. Like, you, you told me the entire time how wonderful I was, and yet you're only giving me a 70% bonus. Well, why didn't I get 100 or 110? So I found I actually had to go into that coach mode to say, okay, here's the things I really needed you to do better. Right? You did this great, but here's where you could have improved. Here's where you could have done better. This is what I'm expecting from you at your level. And I brought that into my advising here at Marist, and both at IBM and at Marist, I had people consistently say, you know, you're the first person to ever tell me that. Consistently say, you're the first person that's ever really been honest with me about my performance in your class, in my, on my job, in this project. I think people want, we all kind of want to be told. And it's interesting that I'm doing this today, not 40 minutes ago. I was getting my three-year email from three of my faculty colleagues. And it was, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great, you're great. And I kept waiting for the, OK, what do I need to do better, right? I'm not a professional teacher. I did not go to school for teaching. I was a marketing exec at IBM at the end of my career. I know there's things I can do better. When I came here, I didn't even know how to pronounce the word pedagogy. And I'm still not sure I do, right? And yet, there wasn't a lot there. There really wasn't. I think we all desire that. We want to be told what we can do better. That is absolutely a part of being a good coach. And to take that time to tell someone, well, there's a reason why your grade is low. There's a reason why you have to take this class again. There's a reason why, obviously, there's a reason why you're here well after registration and you're still just getting your hold taken off with me. How's your time management skills? Has anybody ever told you you're a procrastinator? Is that sounding familiar? Because I'm getting a sense that maybe you are. Let's work on that together. That's what a coach would do. OK, observation skills can make us better coaches. This is the first O in the cook. So we get a lot of these kinds of questions when they're in here advising us. What minor can I declare? How can I get a waiver? Can you sign my override? What classes do I need to take? I love that last one, freshman are great at that. When we see and hear these questions coming at us when we're looking across that desk at these students, are we then saying, well, 
tell me what you enjoy doing and observing what it is that they tell us. Instead of just saying, well, and so for example, in our school, uh, computer science majors, they can do an IT minor or an IS minor. That's pretty straightforward. I could literally just say, oh, you're CS, do IT or IS. IT means you do hands-on, IS means you like data. Which one would you pick? But by asking them, well, what do you enjoy doing? And hearing them say, well, I'm going abroad to Florence. I've always wanted to learn Italian. I've been taking a bunch of Italian classes. I've been considered an Italian minor. And the students look back at me like, but you're a computer science professor. Why are you telling me I should get a minor in a language? Because it's something you enjoy doing, don't you? Let's explore this. What would it take? Why is this subject difficult for you? You're asking me for a waiver. A lot of the why you need a waiver could be more of a why is that a problem for you? Why don't you want to take this class? Can you sign my override? Why weren't you able to get in? Overrides are the easiest thing that we sign, right? We either sign them or not. We either say to ourselves, I'm not letting more than 30 kids into this class. Or we hear the sob story, boo hoo, boo hoo, and then we sign one before the tears come because they have to get in our class. Or we can say, well, why weren't you able to get in? Oh, I was sleeping in. Oh, I was sick. All right, sick, I could be ill for you. You slept in, your alarm didn't go off. How are you with time management? This is a project management class I'm overriding you into. That's fundamentally a part of this class. Are you ready for this class? Are you going to be able to do this? What classes do I need to take? Why haven't I seen your four-year plan? As a matter of fact, I often start with this question. When in doubt, if you want to observe what's going on with the students, start with a why question. Don't just sign that form. Think about, could you ask them a why? And you can literally just say why. There's also a great trick to ask why six times. I usually get to three or four, and then it becomes annoying. Um, but there's a, there's a trick that they teach us at IBM Management School to kind of get people to open up and really to understand requirements from clients, and it's the six why rule. Ask why six times in a row. Um, so I try to start with a why question. Observing behaviors. Um, if you have children of your own, I know you can do this. If you have grandchildren, nieces, or nephews, you probably still can do this. If you've spent any time at all with children, I know you can do this. We have, as adults, the innate ability to sense when there's something up with a child when it sits down in our office. And these are children. I have a junior here, a freshman here, and I have one in high school. So the kids that I'm advising are the same age as all of my kids. I know when they come in and they're anxious. I know when they come in and they're scared about something or nervous. As advisors, are we taking the time to say, hey, you know, I feel there's something you're not telling me. Something's going on here. You okay? And just open up that dialogue. At times, the students that we have, this is that coaching moment that you've been waiting for that will give you that immortality that we discussed because all you did was just recognize that they were feeling something that they haven't been able to talk to anyone about. And by allowing yourself to be that parental type person for a moment in their life could be all they need for their day, for their semester, and for that chance of making you the coolest professor they've ever experienced. Can you tell if somebody's organized? As I said earlier, right, I ask this almost every time someone comes in, especially during the advising season that we're in now. What's your plan? Hey, how's it going? Come on in. I can't remember your name. Give me your CWID. Hey, what's your plan? While I'm looking you up. I start there. And the ones that go, uh, well, that's what I came to talk to you about. I know you have work to do. The ones that go, I've been using the planning tool. I love this new tool. And I've got my four-year plan. Remember, we talked about it last year. I love those. The more you do this, the more of those you get. So this is also, side note, about making advising easier. Are they indecisive? Are they unable to make up any of their decisions that they need to? Why have you made this decision? 
why are you coming to me to talk about taking this class instead of that other class that we talked about earlier? What's your priority here? Is this about going abroad? Remind me again, are you going abroad and we need to do some things to squeeze your computer classes in because we don't teach any of them in Italy? Is that what's going on here? Why, why are we doing this? Observation, hints, and tips, and skills. I'm sure you all have other observation skills, hints, and tips that you can share. I'd love to hear about them. All right, let's move to the next O, which is openness. You've got to be open to new possibilities. Let's go back to our analogy here of cooking. Anybody ever have a recipe and then you changed it? Right? Did it work? It's different, but it's close. But you tried it. Did you ever have one where you changed something and you were like, wow, this is way better than the original recipe? Those happen every now and then, too. Make a little notes in the cookbook, you know, say, I like this instead. I'm glad you brought that up. From the treasure trove. This was another little nugget that we pull out of the dust. I haven't even gone through all of this, but let's pull, let's pull some of these out here. I'm going to pull out the section that's on cakes. And in going through these, one of the awesome things about my grandmother's treasure trove of recipes, and I only had to go five cards deep to find an example of what I'm talking about, coconut oatmeal cookies. The first cool thing is that she always denoted which family member this came from. It came from Bobby. So this is Bobby's recipe. That's uh, one of my dad's cousins. And there is clearly a call for one cup of butter creamed. It has been crossed out, and in blue ink it says use Crisco. So my grandmother learned something, changed that recipe. She was open to taking a family recipe and altering it in a way that allowed it to become better. I found one this morning. Uh, here's, here's an example of it. I found another one just now. Lemon frosted pecan bars. She actually wrote in the upper corner, good, underline, underline, exclamation point. Right, like this is the one I'm now going to bake for Christmas this year. And there was a couple more like that where it's like very good. Um, love these notations. This one came from Beulah Hill. Don't you love the old names from a long time ago? I'm going to name one of them, see if I can get a grandchild named Beulah. That'd be awesome. All right. So I'm making this point about being open to change. You can actually amaze yourself. So first, you've got to be able to open your mind. And all four of you are capable of that because you're here listening to me. Hopefully I have something intelligent to say, but at least you're open to listening to me. And then you've got to be able to open their minds, help them understand that possibilities always exist, and help them with that first step it takes to do something different. Right? They don't have a box full of some hundred-year-old ladies' recipes with the notations of what changed and what worked already. They're trying to figure their own stuff out. But as we're going to explore, um, the fact that you've all lived the lives you have puts you in a position to be that box of hundred-year-old recipes with the notations in them already. Share a story. They came for advice, so what's the best way to make somebody remember the advice that you gave them? It's through storytelling. We all have examples of stories that are powerful that we remember. Some of them we remember when we have to think about what the real reason we remember it was. Sometimes it's just because the story of Hansel and Gretel was something that was read to us. But the lesson of leaving breadcrumbs so that you can always find your way back, well, that's a life lesson. That's a good one. We probably all remember some stories from the Bible or an Aesop's fable or some children's story, and the reason we remember them is because they were a story. They weren't just a fact to spit at us. So there's plenty of facts that were spit at us in our public school or private school upbringing that we've long forgotten, and thankfully now we have Google, so we can look it up anyway. We don't need to remember it. But the things we do remember, I would venture to say, are probably all related to stories. So use 
the stories of your life, dig into your recipe index of the things you've tried that worked for you, they're likely to work for your students too. If they're stuck in an anxious place and you've dealt with anxiety in the past, tell them how you got out of it. If they're stuck with a tough decision about the job they're going to take, and you've all made decisions about the jobs that you've taken over the courses of your careers, share with them a story from your past. It will help them. Okay. And then finally, the K and Cook, keep trying. Keep trying different things in your advising sessions until something works. Try just one thing from today's presentation with one advisee. And then make a mental note for yourself as to whether it worked or not. Try something different each interaction that you have with a student. We all have the students that come just once during advising season and are gone and we never see them again. But we have some students that come back because they like talking with us. So there's your opportunity. Try a story with one the second time they come to your office. Try telling them something out of your past. Try being open to listening to them by just asking them a why question and see if these work for you. Try again if it doesn't work at first. Don't give up. Advising is hard. I do believe it's one of the things they should be paying us for. We love to teach and teach for free, but Advising is work. Coaching people is work. It was a big part of my job as an IBM manager to coach and advise people. I earned my money doing it. And try following up. A simple thing as saying as they leave your office, hey, don't be a stranger. Come see me more often. That might be enough to get them to come back. Keep trying until you reach them. So that's the material I have to cover for you today. It's all about advising by using some coaching methods, having good observation skills about the students that are sitting across that desk from you, about being open-minded about new ways to explore advising with your students, and to keep trying. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions or comments, or we can look at recipes. Thoughts? How'd I do? All right. Our challenge will be to apply this to graduate students. That's all we have. Grad students, we have a bunch. I teach. Yeah, they're a different degree. Do you guys have a lot of international students too? No. Like, like ninety-eight percent of our grad students are from India. Yeah, so for starters, the grad students, do your grad students actually have to come in for advising sessions? Yes. They have a little bit of space. Yeah. Okay. So the they don't get to choose what classes they are in pre program. Like, yeah, they'll live with us okay. for the next three years. Okay, so. literally. Cool. So you do spend a lot of time in and outside the classroom with yeah. advising. Um, so it's probably more of advising of life things that are going on yeah. in these classes. Yeah. Are, you're talking early 20-somethings that are yep. trying to find out where they're going in life. Yeah, I think this is where I'm going to Oh, exactly. Exactly. Um, I had one last night, one of my grad students, he actually tracked me down at the end of one of my undergrad courses. He's like waiting at the door. And he got a job offer and didn't know what to do. Right? He'd been talking to me all along about him wanting to you know, look for another job. And I'd been encouraging him, giving him some ideas of where to look. He'd found a place down in lower Manhattan. It's a lot more money, but it's lower Manhattan, right? He's a local individual, born and raised here in the valley. That's a shocker. Yeah, and, and he knows what's involved. Um, but I do, I do spend a fair amount of time doing that too. And sometimes that then becomes your job, right? It's not about what class you're going to take and how do you get a, a hold lifted. It is, you know, them wanting advice from you about their lives. Um, which is actually scarier, right? If you mess up an override or which class they're in, they're probably still going to graduate. If you mess up, if I mess up with this guy on whether or not he should take the job down in lower Manhattan, I could have an influence on his life that's detrimental or wonderful. There's no in the middle. <laughs> I'm either going to screw him all up or he's going to do really, really well. 
Um, I think another, so not covered here, but another key to advising, especially in those types of life situations, is you're having a dialogue without telling them what to do. Right? You, you can't give advice without saying all the caveats that would come with it. And it's much better to say, well, what do you think? Where are you at? Who else have you talked to? What are others telling you? Getting them to just kind of do the reiteration and brain dump. I've literally had uh, adults that I mentor outside of uh, Marist just talk about everything they've already talked with others about. And during that conversation with me, without me saying much other than, mm -hmm, uh -huh, mm -hmm, uh -huh, they come to the conclusion themselves. I'm sure you've experienced that too. Um, yeah, grad student advising is a, a whole different ball of wax. The nice thing about it, though, I think you'll probably agree, is they're a different maturity level. Way different. Um, you know, the undergrads come with things that my kids come with. Grad students come with things that, like my brother and I talk about in our lives. So, very, very different things. Is that helpful? I've done it before. Yeah, you've no, first, first time for me, yeah. Okay. Good. Well, welcome. Uh, I, I liked your point about, you know, getting yeah, kids, especially as undergrads, take ownership for their decision making. Because I do see a lot of that in both over and accommodations. So we have, um, you know, unlike the academic advisors, we're the secondary advisors. Right. So they come to us for a lot of things, but they're not taking ownership for their decisions. They want to know what do you think I should be. I should tell me what to do. Yeah, tell me what to do. Yeah. And, and you know, we always have this conversation, you know, this is your life now. Yeah. You know, and, and I think a lot of it is because I think parents are really involved now in high school, you know, and getting the whole college, and in college process and in college now. And so they're looking for somebody to tell them. So, so I like that idea of going to Marshall. Yeah. Helping them to understand, you know, they, they need to make the decisions now. Yeah. So. I'm always very careful to make sure that I'm not one telling them what to do. Because we can't, right? We've got to get them to come to the conclusion. I'll, and there are different levels of uh, decision making skills in our students. Some literally can't decide, they, they cannot decide. Those are the ones I typically, as undergrads, I send back to their parents. Uh, you know, a, a discussion will unfold and I don't think they're getting to where they're making a decision and then they'll say ah oh. they'll end by saying ah oh, I just don't know what to do and my kind of catch basket for them usually is well this is a big decision so what do your mom and dad think about this are your parents in the picture right you got to kind of be sensitive about that stuff too if you don't already know do you do you have a parent or parents that you can talk to I highly recommend you do right get on the phone text them call them up Right. Most of the, the undergrads, the parents are all my age anyway, so kind uh, of know what's going on in those minds. Very good. All right. Thank you all for coming.